Greetings all! This is Justin. Hi. And that's Nick. I am the hairiest of Nicks. I have my hair tied back because it is a because mess of, today. Because of reasons. And today, the Legion rulebook dropped. Yeah, we have right. the Legion rulebook. It has been a long time coming. I, I do not shy away from the fact that I think this is incredibly late. I don't know why we're nearly into March and we've suddenly got this book, but um, we have it. We have yep. a chance to go through some of the details that we haven't um, had clarified yet, and that makes me very, very happy. Right. Basically, <laughs> what happened with this, um, we had Legion revealed last September, I want to say, or Gen Con was around that time anyway, and we've been waiting for this ever since. Um, I didn't really understand why it took so long for this to come out. We had some articles explaining various parts of the rules, um, you know, activation, attacks, all that kind of stuff, and that was mm. revealed bit by bit. And I thought to myself, okay, this makes sense. They want to reveal a little bit by little bit. And then those articles ended early January and still nothing. Mm. And then a bit over a week ago, we actually had the full rule spoiled because somebody opened up a box and took pictures of each of the individual pages. And it still took over a week for this document to come out, which I don't think is good because I don't think it's good for the game to only have that sort of tainted version of the rules out there in circulation. Yeah. It, like people like just sort of zooming in, trying to interpret pixels. It should have been done that day, in my opinion. Yeah, as and soon as something gets leaked... Just, just, re- just reveal it, yeah. just show us. So people like us aren't just trying to interpret something from what could be tainted. I mean, it could have been tampered with. And Anyway, that's yeah. a whole other conversation about leaks, which I'm going to save for another video. But we have it now. We have a proper version to show you on the screen, full high res, all that fun stuff. So we're going to go through this. front cover. How good does that look? Rather good. Rather good. I'm I'm impressed with that. So, first, full disclaimer. This is not a video teaching you how to play Star Wars Legion. We might do that at some stage, but this is just going to be a video clarifying those rules that we did not see clarified through the various articles. Just a few little advanced rules, a few little nitpicky things that... I've been curious about, um, just moving forward, want to make sure we know every little rule interpretation going into playing Star Wars Legion. So, we are going to scroll down this document and go through everything that we have not had clarified yet, basically. This is just going to be another long, boring video of me and Justin going through a game document. Because apparently that's what you guys want. You want a couple of nerdy, hairy guys just reading a bunch of words. I'm okay with it. I enjoy it myself, actually. Let's start <laughs> off this mumbo jumbo. First up, we have on the first page just a bunch of stuff going through the basic round orders. We know everything about this so far. So mm. let's continue scrolling through. We have a nice uh, set of high res images of all the different game components. Yeah, That's nice. Looks good. Absolutely. Um, Shows you what comes in everything I like the round counter yes um, this is basically it's just a pre-coloured X-Wing dial I mean they use dials in a lot of their games like mm. Armada um, even Legend of the Five Rings has some kind of weird dial oh, you really? do to, um, to, oh, I'm playing as the dragon or the scorpion this round or something like that yeah. um, but it's just something that they've repainted um, yeah. a good way of representing the rounds the round counter is passed between each player um, and they in turn change the round I think it's yeah. to stop cheating so each player is in everyone knows what round it is sort yeah of it. and each player controls it so they're constantly checking it there is a few rules um, that are decided based on who's holding the round counter mm-hmm. um, it's just a weird interaction I don't know why they had to do that but um, I mean, it's interesting yeah. nonetheless also, the victory tokens look cool. Yeah, the commander token looks awesome. I quite like the look of that. Ooh, yeah. Uh, now, this is important because at the start of each round, you have to choose which of your commanders is the commander because you can field more than one. And we'll go through a bit more of that later. Uh, and if all your commanders die, you can make one of your captains the commander as well. Oh, also. Yes? The, the objective token got revealed, and that looks really nice. Yeah, it does look nice. Um, you have a side for captured and a side for inactive or yeah. whatever that means so basically if you have to capture certain points um, if your unit's near it you can have it face up so it's glowing red and say hey it's mine it counts yeah. towards victory points very cool very cool apart from that always good to have some nice high-res images 
the card anatomy. We're not going to go through that here. We've done this a thousand times before. But if you want to have a look at this, um, download the document and go through it yourself. It's definitely worth familiarizing yourself with if you haven't already. Definitely. Absolutely. All right. Now, the golden rule and resolving disputes. This is interesting. First yeah. of all, we'll do the golden rule because this pretty much applies to all FFG games. The golden rule is a fundamental concept on which all other rules are built. If something in this reference contradicts the learn to play booklet, the rules reference takes precedent. If an effect on a card or another component contradicts rules found in the learn to play booklet or rules reference, that component takes precedence. If a card effect uses the word cannot, the effect the effect is absolute and cannot be overridden by any other game effects. Which makes sense. Makes sense. Um, that pretty much is how all gamers work. Um, basically, that means if you find two things contradict each other, uh, this is the precedence that which you take. Um, it's the word cannot, the rules reference, and the learn to play. Um, mm. In general, it's what's written on the cards that are most important. Yeah. Um, and then everything kind of follows after that. Now, this is interesting. Resolving disputes. Players should always attempt to come to an agreement regarding disputes about situations on the battlefield. If players cannot come to an agreement, such as determining the range between two miniatures or line of sight, blah, 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 mm. the player with the round counter should roll a red defense dice on a block result. That player interpretation of the situation is in considered to be correct and play continues. On any other result, the interpretation of the player without the round counter is considered correct and play continues. Um, this it's is weird. weird. Yeah, <laughs> this is sense. very weird. Um, this is great for casual play, but with any game, especially any FFG game, if you don't know and you can't agree with something, call a judge. Yeah. Don't. Um, I don't understand why we have to have random interpretations. I mean, for line of sight, yeah, okay, I get that. Mm. The problem is this is abusable. Um, someone can just say, no, you don't have line of sight, like yeah. every single turn, and they just get a 50-50 shot of being right every time. I, I feel like... This is good if people are honourable, but yeah. not everyone's honourable. Not everyone does this kind of stuff. Um, people can be jerks. People can be jerks. And often are. Um, I think, mm. in general, FFG Star Wars gamers aren't, yeah. which is a great thing about our community, especially with X-Wing. I've noticed that. Mm. Um, but I, I just think, in any tournament play, don't do this. Call a judge over, guys. Yeah. Um, if, you know, if you're in a tournament, if you're in a shop, uh, the store owner will be more than happy to help you out with this kind of stuff. It, it's basically what you should do. Definitely. I, I'm not sure what the deal with this is, but um, there you go. Um, okay. Oh, yes, we have an interesting tidbit about upgrade cards here. Oh. Upgrade cards are equipped to a unit of an army. Each upgrade card costs the number of points shown in the lower right-hand corner of the card for each upgrade icon. On the unit's upgrade bar, it may equip one upgrade bar with the matching upgrade icon. But this right here... A unit cannot equip more than one copy of the same upgrade card. Now, um, I did a Legion list building video with Gareth a little while ago, and one of you guys in the comments actually pointed this out to me. Um, it just wasn't revealed in any of the rules articles. Um, we kind of assumed this was the case because we were talking about in that video the ATSD mortar launcher. And if you have like one on each side of the face and on the front, it would look kind of dumb. Mm. Um, and we kind of assumed that this was the case, although. If you could have multiple mortar launchers, that'd be hilarious because then you could like triple suppress a unit and then make oh. them flee immediately. Yeah, disgusting. Yeah, a bit disgusting. Um, so good. Um, yep. Basically, if we were to interpret this like in X Wing or Armada terms, this just basically says every card has the keyword limited. Mm. In that, uh, in the game of X Wing, you can have as many of the same type of card if you want. Unless it has the word limited, that means you can only have one copy of that card equipped to that unit. Um, and that's just a hard and fast rule for everything in Legion, which I think is a good thing. Mm. I think it, it makes perfect sense for this game. So during the setup, um, I talked briefly about this when we were had the article about the command cards and how we choose that and that kind of stuff. Mm. And there's a couple of things clarified here, which I quite like. Basically, um, we declare terrain, we place terrain, uh, and it's basically what I thought it was going to be mm. in that you just agree. You come to some kind of an agreement you place things, maybe like one at a time, but there's no set way to place terrain. Oh. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I think if a shop wants to, in a tournament, decide, okay, this is the way that you must set up terrain, 
uh, whether that be one person places something, another person places something, or uh, it's a point system. I, I don't know, whatever. I think it's best left loose um, mm. because I think that's just the best way to do things. It's going to create more interesting gameplay. Yeah, exactly right. If you want to make asymmetrical boards, that's still fine because of the rest of what's happening here. Um, mm. We have initiative bids in this, or at least the equivalent of initiative bids. I don't call it that in this, but the person with the lowest squad point cost gets to choose to either be the blue or the red player, and mm. that changes what edge of the board they're on. Yeah. So this is relevant. Um, if you set up a board asymmetrically and make one side probably more favourable, you run the risk of just not being able to be on the right side. Um, so that's worth thinking about. You yeah. basically can't just set up a board to only favour you. Mm. Um, there is checks and balances built into it. The player whose army has the lowest point total chooses to be either the red player or the blue player. Then the blue player chooses one of the long table edges and sets their army near that edge. The red player takes the other long table edge. If both players' armies have the same point total, roll a die or flip a coin to determine which player chooses to be red or blue. Cool. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. And it's also relevant for these deployment cards because basically uh, the blue player chooses uh, which card to veto first. Yeah. Um, so you may want to intentionally make yourself the red player. It doesn't mean... It means you don't get to choose what side you're on first, but it does mean you get to veto last. And I think that's how this is balanced. You yeah. Know, I think during the defining the battlefield step where you choose these cards you probably want to be the red player because I think vetoing last is going to be very potent you have the last say on which of these cards become relevant but yeah. you don't get the first say on which side of the battlefield you're on I think both of those are valuable yeah. and it's yeah. the way this is all balanced out and it yeah. just makes good sense it just depends on how yeah your army is built and how you want to go about it and you then see what the opponent's doing and yeah, yeah. I, I just like the way this is all balanced. It just makes perfect sense. All right, now we have a long part of the document, which is all to do with terrain. Now, we're not going to go through all of this because it's very long and very boring. <laughs> Basically, if you have... Um, a, there's difficult terrain to move across, and mm. in those instances, your unit moves a speed uh, one mm. less than their total. Unless it's already one. Yeah, to a minimum of one. So Vader doesn't just stand in a swamp and can't move. Mm. That'd be dumb. Um, and, of course, there's impassable terrain, which just means you cannot move through it. And uh, this is all standard wargaming stuff. Yeah. We have a nice little chart here, which basically gives us a rough interpretation of what most things should do, yeah. which is good. Um, it also lists what happens to vehicles, to repulsive vehicles and that kind of stuff, which is really good. Yeah. Really good to see that kind of stuff. Uh, it just gives you a good rule of thumb. And again, if you don't agree with your opponent on something, you just refer back to this. And yeah. it's a pretty safe bet on what to do. And this is an example of what they've called competitive terrain. Um, by the way, guys, in this document, there are several of these sort of dark boxes, and these are sort of more advanced rules, and we'll make sure we go through all of these. Mm. To simulate two armies attempting to choose the optimal location for combat, the player may place terrain in such a way that they believe will have them at an advantage. The player set aside an even number of terrain pieces that cover roughly a quarter of the battlefield, choosing some pieces that will block line of sight and some that will simply provide cover. Starting with the player whose armies has the lowest total value, if both players' army have the same point, flip a coin, uh, player takes turns placing a single piece of terrain on the battlefield beyond range one of all other pieces of terrain. Oh, like asteroids next week, I guess, yeah. Hmm. If terrain cannot be placed beyond range one, the player may place it anywhere on the battlefield as long as it's not touching another piece of terrain. After hmm. players have finished setting up terrain, proceed to step four. Okay. So this seems to be like some kind of optional rule, yeah. which I think is good. Yeah. Uh, it's basically what I was talking about before. We have taken in turns, but there's a bit more rules in terms of it can't be within range one. Okay, we have a little article about vertical climbing, and this is definitely worth talking about. So vertical cohesion. This unit is in cohesion because it fulfills the following three requirements. Measured horizontally, each mini is no further away from the unit leader than the length of the speed one movement tool. Each mini in the unit is within one height of each other mini. The unit climbed down this round and each mini in the unit is placed such that the distance between it and the unit leader is a legal speed one or climb move. 
Okay, that's very interesting because it's still in cohesion, but it's still needed to climb mm. um, to be on that different plane. It's a very niche example. I don't really understand how that's going to give you an advantage in the battlefield. No. Um, but, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's good yeah. to know you can do that kind of stuff. We also have a nice section on clambering here, which is interesting. The Rebel Trooper unit leader is in base contact with the impassable terrain, which is within height one. Oh, by the way, guys, height one is denoted by the speed one template. Mm. The Rebel player spends one move action to quickly clamber up, placing the unit leader on top of the terrain. The Rebel player rolls three white dice, one for each mini. He rolls a block result and suffers one wound and loses one Rebel Trooper. Just so you know, guys, on the white dice, there is one block and one surge. Meaning when you, re- when you roll these white defense dice, you have a one in six chance of losing a mini. It's relatively low, but any block just flat out loses a mini. You don't get to defend yourself or anything like that, yeah. which is not ideal. The remaining rebel trooper is placed in cohesion. Makes perfect sense. And this is good because we didn't really know the odds of how this worked. We knew that this was how clambering was going to work. There's going to be some odds that you are going to take damage, you lose minis, but it's this one in six that we need mm. to know. And it also helps us understand the full value of grappling hooks because grappling hooks means you don't do any of this, you just clamber and get up there, which yeah. is three points. Yeah. And that's sort of, in Imperial terms, worth about uh, a quarter of a mini, yeah. or in Rebel terms, about a third of a mini. Mm. That feels pretty good. Yeah. Considering you're rolling multiple white dice to have these effects... I feel like if that saves one mini, and if you're clambering, I don't know, two or three times a game, there's a good chance you're going to lose a mini mm. across those climbs. And that makes grappling hooks for three points very good. Mm. I think mathematically that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, very yeah. cool, very it cool. Depends on how you want to play. Yeah, also that means you can't take targeting scope. So maybe that's yeah. the trade off there. We have a nice, long, boring document about actions and that kind of stuff. But what's cool here. And again, this was clarified uh, during the articles, but by outside sources, not the articles themselves. This little icon here denotes an action that you can take, but it costs one of your actions. Mm. This little icon here is a free action. Now, you can't take more than one of the same free action. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them have to um, tap down in order to use anyway. But uh, it's good to know the distinction between these icons. In case you guys are wondering, uh, seeing these icons... Um, for example, this is on Luke's jump, uh, but this would be on most force moves like Jedi Mind Trick. Yeah. yeah, These are free, these take an action. Now let's talk a bit about Rally, because this is something that we didn't have greatly clarified during the articles. Mm. Basically, Rally happens at the start of a unit's activation. And if a unit is panicking and fleeing, this is the only way they can remove suppression. So at the start of their activation, they roll a white defense dice for each of their suppression tokens on a dodge or a surge. Uh, they remove one of their suppression tokens. In other words, so, a one in three shot. Yeah. yeah. So that's not bad. It's good. They need it some way. Um, otherwise, if panicking units are just moving away and your command is all the way over here and you can't get to them to uh, help deal with their suppression, um, they're a bit stuffed. Yeah. So they needed some kind of way of helping them. Um, basically, this is good. It means if you're just um, beyond that point of panicking and you just get rid of one token, you can then recover to get rid of all the tokens. And then you're all the way back to not panicking, yeah. uh, which is good. There needed to be some way of doing this. Otherwise, your unit will just panic and there's no way to deal with it. It basically is equivalent to killing a unit, yeah. which you don't want to deal with. Don't no. want to deal with. So that makes perfect sense. That's how you rally. By the way, guys, we're currently going through the glossary of all the terms, and most of these we have covered because they are clarified on the unit cards. But if there's anything giving us a bit more information, we'll stop on it and have a quick chat about it. Okay, now we have a page here talking about the attack pool, and this is very interesting. Mm. I had a quick chat about this with Gareth the other day, but we didn't really have this all clarified, so it's good to know. Basically, when you choose to perform an attack, uh, for each mini, you choose one of their weapons and they add it to the attack pool. Um, But you can choose different defenders. However, each weapon of the same type, in this example, an E11 blaster, must have the same target. Mm. But what's really interesting, um, every keyword uh, modification on a weapon 
affects every dice in the attack pool. Yeah, this is awesome. It is awesome. In this example, the rocket launcher guy only would give his impact bonus on this pool because he's chosen to shoot something else. Mm. If he were, say, shooting at this, which I assume is like Luke Skywalker or something, then his impact three from his weapon would be uh, done to this entire pool. And that's very relevant. Yeah. It basically means you have the option of shooting different targets and giving yourself a bit more presence on the battlefield, but you also have the option of focus firing and giving yourself all these attack bonuses into the one pool. Which is very fun. It is. Um, because on um, these three black dice, impact three probably isn't going to help you that much. Impact changes your regular hits to criticals. Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably not going to get three regular hits. It's probably not going to happen every single time. Mm. But across this entire pool, you probably will. And that means that your regular blaster rifles are actually usable against vehicles. Mm. So long as there is a bazooka or a rocket launcher or a sniper rifle or something of that nature in your attack pool modifying all your dice. It's very interesting. I like it. I like it a lot too. Um, I was concerned um, with these impact values that they'd only put the one weapon. Yeah. And if that were the case, then that mini becomes sacrosanct. You have to use that mini to hit that kind of thing. But basically, this means this mini is, has extra value. Considering how expensive they are, like they're 30 plus points for the guys with rocket launchers. Yeah. I think this makes it more worth it. This goes, okay, this is why you want these guys in your squad. Because they're giving a universal buff to all your units and... Mm. You feel pretty good about that. Okay, there's a section in this document talking about cohesion. Now, we've covered cohesion pretty in-depth. We even had that um, block before where we had the guy on the different plane, and that explains it in a bit better detail. But there's a little section on advanced cohesion, which I think is very interesting. The Stormtrooper is in cohesion because the distance between it and the unit leader is equal to the length of the Speed 1 movement tool, and it can perform a Speed 1 move around the impassable terrain. But number two here, Ooh. which is this guy here, this Stormtrooper is not in cohesion because it cannot perform a speed one move through the impassable terrain. So it's not just a speed one radius. It must be a physical move to the captain. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I guess that means you can't put things in weird nooks and crannies, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, it means you don't have just this insane control over the battlefield. You can't put your units in just really weird, annoying spots. Uh, I like this. Mm. I think this... If this wasn't the case, units might have a bit too much reach and they could have better line of sight and some weird scenarios. So this is good. Now, we have some very interesting information about commanders. Again, this wasn't uh, clarified in the commander article we had, but um, whatever. Basically, at the start of every round, you must choose a commander. So if you have more than one, so you have Vader and Veers or Luke and Leia, which might happen. I don't know if those kind of builds are going to make much sense point-wise, but maybe in the future we'll have two affordable commanders, uh, Hmm. maybe generics or something like that. But basically, uh, you must choose a commander and you must choose a card that is either generic or specific to that commander. Obviously, if you make Vader your commander, you cannot give him a Veers card. Makes perfect sense. And then you assign orders based on which commander you had. Um, so uh, Vader must give orders to guys range one to three of him or with com links or anything like that. Um, if at the end of your turn you do not have a commander, uh, you then assign the command token to one of your captains or a unit leader from one of your troops anyway. If you have no captains, you don't have any commanders and then you do not choose command cards. When you do not choose command cards, no matter what command card your opponent chooses, they always get priority. Wow. That could suck. I mean, at the point of having no commanders, you've pretty much lost the game anyway. Unless it's like round six and you've already had all the victory points and you're fine at that point. Mm. But, um, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen very often. No. Uh, We've had a few people comment, like, oh, to win the game, just beat Darth Vader. Look, guys, if you try and kill Darth Vader, you're probably just devoting too many resources to doing things that are not the objectives, and you'll lose the game. Yeah. So just be aware of that. Um, This is very niche circumstances, but it had to be clarified. So that's a very good thing as well. Nice to have clarifications. Never going to complain about that. Okay, we have another very specific example about how to use cover. Uh, At least half the minis in the Defender are obscured. Therefore, the entire unit gets the benefit of cover. Fine. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Two of three of them 
two of the three minis are in light cover and one is in heavy cover. Since more minis are in light cover than heavy cover, the unit is considered to be in light cover. Okay, fair enough. Hmm? Additionally, because the line of sight is totally blocked from the ATRT to one stormtrooper, that stormtrooper cannot be defeated. Even if this unit suffers five or more wounds, that... Oh, okay. It's very niche, very narrow, but this could happen. Hmm. So basically what this is saying is... If this suffers five wounds, you only remove these four stormtroopers because this cannot be hit by that cannon no matter what. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, this is this is good because this is going to happen in a tournament somewhere in the world, and we must get we must get clarification for that. We must have an example of how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, yeah, good to have examples because this stuff is very narrow and it's going to cause arguments somewhere. And this is the section where height has been clarified. To measure an object's height, a player places the end of the range ruler flat on the battlefield surface as close to the object as possible. The range ruler should be oriented vertically. The segment of the range ruler that the top of the object is at is equal to the object's height. So uh, talking about the air speeders, um, the speeder bikes, climbing, clambering, they all refer to height one, height two, all that kind of stuff. And this is how you do it. You just put the range ruler on the table, and depending on how high it is, that is how high it is hmm. um, in terms of how you refer to it on those cards. Now, it is worth talking about line of sight because some different games interpret line of sight differently. Basically, this is how you decide whether this mini can see this mini and whether or not you can attack it in the process. Line of sight is used to determine if one mini can see another mini. I just said that. <laughs> a player determines line of sight from the perspective of a mini using a viewpoint where the center of the mini's base meets the top of the mini's sculpt. Okay, so I guess you just measure from the eyes. If a player can see part of an opponent's mini, which includes the mini's base, from that viewpoint, that player's mini has line of sight on the opponent. Now, a couple of people have complained about this um, because it is left a bit to interpretation. You have to choose um, a point on the mini and you have to sort of measure it. Um, in games like Infinity, we actually have line of sight markers, and you have to see a certain percentage, uh, depending on oh. where it is, and then you can use a laser to kind of measure that. Yeah. Uh, this is left a bit more to interpretation, and that's left some people a bit salty, because it's taken the more realistic route, rather than what's more balanced for gameplay. Mm. At least what's easier to interpret during gameplay. Um, look, I don't have much experience in that myself, so I can't really comment too much. But it is worth noting that this is how they've decided to do it in Legion. Okay, and then we have a section of the document talking about melee. Melee is basically when you're in base contact with your units. We have this little advanced rule situation. Basically what it's saying is for something to be in base contact, every mini in that unit must be in base contact, and they're always in base contact. And with the example of one mini being defeated or destroyed, this unit here then moves into base contact with another one. Yeah. If you're in base contact, you are always in base contact with every single mini, and that doesn't change. You're not half in base contact. Yeah. Um, it, it's basically a gameplay over realism. We're mm. just keeping it nice and straightforward. Uh, everything's in base contact, and we're just keeping it nice and simple, which I quite like. Uh, here we have a section clarifying repulsive vehicle movement. A repulsive mm. vehicle mini can move through all types of units. Uh, it cannot reverse climb or clamber. Imagine an airspeeder going in reverse. That'd be mm. kind of dumb. Yep. When performing a standard move, a repulsive vehicle can move onto or over a piece of terrain that has a height that is equal to or less than the height of the leader's mini. Cool. When a repulsive vehicle mini finally moves position would overlap one or more trooper minis during a compulsory move, those minis are displaced. So you can't overlap things. You can't put uh, your little troopers onto the base of your repulsor. Mm. They just get pushed to one side, which I think makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, I had the question, um, Arj, if you're watching, uh, can you make something jump onto a repulsor vehicle? Can Luke Skywalker ride an airspeeder? Mm. Um, think about, um, what's it, Kanan Jarrus, uh, yeah. jumping onto the protected starfighter and ripping Kanan and ripping um, Fen Rao out of the cockpit. Yeah. No, no, you can't do that in Legion, unfortunately. If they collide, they just move to one side. You can't stack minis on top of each other. 
Look, that'd be fun flavor wise, but I think for gameplay, let's just keep it simple. And I think this is probably the right way to approach it. So we have a section clarifying panic. Now we knew panic um, was basically when you triple the suppression value, something starts to flee the battlefield. And this just clarifies how that works. Basically, if your unit is panicked, the only way to unpanic yourself is to get your suppression token value below the three times your constitution. Mm. So you have to start removing tokens before your unit's unpanicked. When you're panicked, you can only do one action per turn. That must be a move, and that must be towards the closest table edge. And it has to it has to be the full movement as well. The full movement, that is correct. Um, if your unit leader goes off the table edge, you have destroyed that unit, and you feel pretty bad about it. Mm. So if you're panicked... You basically have to rally, get rid of those suppression tokens, or you get your commander and you run them towards that unit so they get that new suppression value. Mm. Um, and then, like, if it's Vader and you manage to just get Vader as the Stormtroopers are trying to flee, the Stormtroopers then have no panic because Vader does not suffer from panicking. It's because they're more panicked about Vader. Than they're more panicked about Vader, <laughs> yeah. If we flee, he's going to kill us. Yeah. If we stay, that airspeed is going to kill us. But you know what? I'll take the airspeed yeah. over Vader any day. Yep. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So basically, if something's fleeing, you have very few options to try and save it, but you can. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. Also, just quickly, a panic unit cannot perform free actions. Yes, very important. Um, so if, like, Luke Skywalker was panicked, he can't do his Jedi mind trick or his push. Not going to happen that often. Uh, I don't think that Stormtrooper units or Rebel units can take free actions as it is. Mm. But it's something to look out for just in case it ever happens. Okay, let's spend a bit of time talking about resilience. Could you read that first paragraph, please? Resilience is an attribute presented on each vehicle unit card. A vehicle's unit resilience is indicated by the value next to its resilience icon. In this case, on here, it's 4. Uh, when a vehicle suffers a wound, it causes it to have a wound token equal to or exceeding its resilience value. That player rolls a red defense dice and suffers one of the following results. So what I was talking about uh, in a previous article, uh, you get one of these negative effects on your vehicle, but the article did not explain how you choose them. You have a one in three chance just by rolling a dice. That is what happens. Uh, mm. By the way, somebody pointed that out in the comment section, and I thank you very much for that. It's just nice to have it here in the rules. Uh, plain as day for us to see. So if you roll a block, you are damaged. The unit is damaged and gains a damage token. When a player activates a damaged unit, they roll a white defense dice. If it's a blank, the vehicle performs one pure, one fewer action. It becomes disabled if the result is blank. A unit is disabled, cannot reverse, and must spend two actions to perform a standard move. And if you roll a surge, they get weapons destroyed. Uh, by the way, there's only one surge on the dice, so it is not quite one in three. Uh, but weapons destroyed is very serious. Your opponent chooses one of your weapons and puts a weapons destroyed token on it. That weapon's gone. You cannot use it for the rest of the game. Um, that can, like ATRT with the cannon, that cripples it completely. Yeah. yeah. And you feel pretty bad about it. And that's why it must be a surge. A surge is the lowest odds you can roll on a dice. It's only ever one surge on every single dice, mm. uh, which is probably a good thing. I think that makes the most sense. Disabling a weapon could be the difference between a unit becoming completely unusable. So mm. you've got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Uh, just quickly, with resilience, if a vehicle already has a damage token, a disabled token, or a weapon destroyed token, it cannot gain another one of these due to suffering runes, but it can gain another one. But it can gain one through other game effects. Interesting. So there'll probably be cards that say this somehow. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Now, resolving what happens when we both reveal a command card with the same number of pips. During the command phase, if both players reveal a card that has the same number of pips, the player who has the round counter rolls a red defense dice. If the result is a block, that player has priority. Otherwise, their opponent has priority. In other words, there's a one in two chance that you'll get priority or your opponent get priority. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's how it should work. That's how it should work. There's no initiative bid when it comes to pips. Um, I think that would be too overpowering. 
and that would make initiative bits too valuable in this game. I don't think we want this game to be about who has initiative. It's no. not what this game's trying to do. That's more an X-Wing with aces and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so this makes perfect sense. I think that's the best way to approach that. Just a quick clarification on the section talking about upgrade cards. We have something talking about light side and dark side. Basically, uh, as we said, dark side is empire, light side is rebels. Yep. Um, only units of the Rebel Alliance faction can equip upgrade with a light side only restriction. Um, still, it does not explain why it says light side and not rebel. So, again, we talked about this before. It's probably going to have different factions and they're going to have light and dark alignments for every faction. Yeah. Um, it just for the time being, this is what it's going to say. Um, I think what's going to happen if we do get other factions, we'll get another core set, and then that will add that to this document, and that will explain why it says light and dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't see any reason for it to say light and dark. You're just saying Empire and Rebel. Okay. At the end of this PDF, we have two different game types. Mm-hmm. Now, just like Epic in X Wing, this might not get um, decent tournament support. I don't know what FFG are planning on doing with this, but let's talk about it right now. Yeah. First up, Grand Army. Players who wish to play a larger game may construct Grand Armies instead of Standard Armies, and they have 1,600 points instead of 800 points. It's played on a mat of 4x6 instead of 6x3. Uh, they do not draw any deployment cards, and during setup 6, each player only has one opportunity to eliminate a card. Ooh. Yeah. Finally, during step 8, each player deploys units within range 2 of a 4 foot edge of the battlefield opposite their opponent just in a big lock you don't have weird like disarray deployments with Grand Army that'd be no fun at all (laughs) Um, but yeah Grand Army's just like I'm here I'm here just a lot a lot of fun essentially Um, this is I guess the equivalent to Epic in Legion yeah and um, it also shows here Mm-hmm. Each Grand Army must include the following. One of three commander units, five to ten core units, five up to five special force units, up to five support units, or up to three heavy units. Which is kind of cool. Which is pretty much the same as where we were before, except instead of three trooper units, we must have at least five. Yeah. Maximum of ten. Good. Hmm. Good. That's pretty much how it should be. Um, if it was still minimum of three, you'd have a very bad time playing Grand Army yeah. you get nothing done um, but yeah it sounds really exciting it sounds like something we'll have to try on the channel at some stage yeah uh, that's that's. It, I, I think after a couple of expansions come out yeah pretty much pretty much I look at this and think oh this is going to be that thing that you do then you never want to play Legion again at least for a month <laughs> or so <laughs> um, and also we have a very similar thing unlimited rounds Players who want to play a desperate battle to the end can use this rule. The game does not end after six rounds. Instead, the game ends only when one player's units are defeated. During the setup, skip five to seven and simply deal a single random deployment card. (laughs) Oh, that could could wreck. That could seriously wreck some people. At the end of every sixth round, each player returns all of the command cards they discarded during the game back to their hand. Then the player with the round counter resets to one and passes the round counter to their opponent. If players wish the rules for unlimited rounds to be combined with the rules of Grand Armies for truly epic conflict, you are insane. When doing so, skip uh, steps five to seven and use deployment rules for Grand Armies. Oh, oh, that would take hours. That's that's getting into forty k um, territory. That kind yeah. of stuff. But look, you can if you want. Um, the key thing with Legion is this is not about just wiping out your opponent's army. It's yeah. not what the game's about. We have a clear, succinct game which is meant to last about an hour, and you're meant to do objectives and get victory points. Um, it's meant to be nice and clean and succinct. Um, and some people love that kind of big scale 40k space marines and everything and hours later you're still halfway through the game. Yeah. That's cool. You have the option to do that with this game if you want. Um, it's not really what the game's designed to do. Mm. I don't think you're going to get that quite that same play experience. No. But it is an option nonetheless. It's good for those people that want to do it though. Absolutely. Those people that go, ooh, the Empire is going to, you know, attack and then, something. And then, as uh, I said, they actually, never want to play Legion again yeah. after that. <laughs> yeah, actually have, like, proper, like, the Battle of Endor or something like that. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. And yeah. then it would feel more like 
legion, as some people have been saying. Mm. That is the end of this document. Mm. Um, guys, if I missed anything that I should have gone through, please let me know in the comments. Uh, but now we pretty much know everything there is to know about this game. Yeah. I feel like I can just buy the box and start playing it um, reasonably yeah. comfortably. Um, I get the impression with a lot of tabletop games, it's not this accessible. Mm. Like you buy 40k and you're constantly referencing the rule books, um, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It takes a few games to learn, but then you have a really in-depth game. This is a little bit lighter, um, but I feel like it's easier to pick up. And yeah. that's great for new players. It's great for accessibility. It means new players will come along as they have with X-Wing. They're going to see it in the shops. They're going to um, talk to some people about it. And because of that accessibility, it's going to have more people buying into it. Um, and that's good fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Justin, any final thoughts? No, I'm getting ready to play this game now. Yeah, pretty much. We're massively hyped about this. I mean, maybe that's why it took so long for this to come out. Maybe they just wanted to hype it up at the last moment. I yeah. still think we should have got this months ago, but uh, glad to have it. Very happy with everything here. Um, nothing, I, I I don't think anything in these rules makes no sense. I think they've gone for a nice, simple, accessible gameplay, mm. just like X-Wing or Armada or something like that. It's very much in keeping with FFG Star Wars titles. Yeah. Only a month ago. In fact, less than a month ago. Mm. In the meantime, guys, we will continue our Legion hype. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. And in the meantime, we'll catch you later. See you guys. Bye.